think that's in for came on. Screw up, Pullman. Welcome to Siddhartha's Intent, Australia, Living is Dying. My name is Sarin, and New Year's greetings to you all. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and other lands and recognise their connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today gives me much pleasure to welcome back to Living is Dying, our highly respected and much loved guest speaker, Eric Pemakunsang, who will speak on the profound Bardo song of reminding oneself. Thank you for being here with us today, dear Eric. Thank you so much. Please nod if you can hear me. Yes. All right. It's better to test it now than in the, uh, at the end. The Bardo song of reminding oneself is a much loved uh, chant that meditators use. I haven't seen it chanted uh, in monastic groups, but solitary meditators and uh, small group retreats they use it uh, together. It's meant for that. And it's the kindness of Padmasambhava and Yeshu Sokyal that we have this song today. It exists in uh, several versions. The most famous one was revealed by Kama Lingpa, uh, together with uh, what is called the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the liberation through hearing in the Baro. But the one that I uh, connected with was revealed by Yeshe Tsokyao uh, in a very uh, auspicious way. And I will tell you that right now. And it differs slightly, some words and some sentences from the Kamalingpa's uh, version. Never mind, in the realm where it came from, they had uh, no real books all was uh, through uh, memory in the wisdom mind of the Dakinis. It happened uh, one day at uh, Samye, while Padmasambhava was there, where he lived approximately 55 years and uh, six months. But one evening he said to Yeshu Sokya in, a, in a, a gathering of students, he said, um, remember your dream tonight. And uh, she wasn't used to get that message, so she li really listened to it. And what happened in the dream was that she was woken up by a voice and she thought it was uh, morning. And when she came out, there were four uh, Dakinis holding a palanquin made of cloth and she said, please take seat. We want to take you for uh, some sightseeing, special sightseeing. So she did that and escorted by the Dakinis of the four classes. She flew from Tibet down over India and she was um, explained the different holy places, Budgaya and Kushinaka and so forth. And then they flew uh, further uh, west and then they said, now we are going to arrive at the holy land of the Dakinis called uh, Udiana. And uh, when she came there, they landed in front of a hu huge uh, pagoda. 
and here Yeshu Sokyal was uh, asked to um, step out of the um, of the palanquin and go and visit and pay respect to the queen of the Dakinis. And when she came in, she saw it was a huge, much larger hall than seen from the outside, almost infinite. And there was a gathering, she said, at least 100,000 Dakinis of all different colors and, and heights. But in the center, there were three, three Dakinis, one blue, one red, and one white. The red one was uh, Vatriyogini, and uh, they had different names. But as he came closer, she prostrated and make a made a request, please give your blessings, empowerments, and uh, accomplishments, which uh, city, which actually means realization. Please share your realization with me. And they did. But first, uh, one of them said, what has taken you so long? Don't you uh, know who you are? Don't you recognize that, that you are here already? And uh, she was uh, received not as a guest, but as a resident Dakini, one of the import most important ones. So when she received the empowerments through the rays of light and uh, uh, extensive teachings in many, many segments that she was supposed to take back uh, with her when she left, she also received particular uh, blessing through which her realization became equal to what it was before she reincarnated. In other words, she was one of the uh, chief uh, enlightened cosmic Dakinis. It's a, a part of the story of Yeshisokiel we don't usually hear. It's often like that with uh, biographies, that those who write it down and retell it and uh, read the biography, they shape it into a way that fits their own anthropomorphical uh, setting. So it's a place, a time with persons, and they interact and so forth much in the way that we do uh, in our waking state. Whether you want to accept this story or not, never mind. I have no problem with it. So I immediately, when I uh, had seen it and translated it a few times, I thought, I love it. My friends will love it too. There's no doubt. So I put it down in a few minutes. And with the help of my wife, we put um, melody uh, um, so that it can be sung. Usually a song is meant to be sung. Isn't that true? You don't have a song and then nobody sings it. So my deep wish is that the, uh, the living word of the Dharma will remain the living word in other words, be used by living people. And as part of that, we now have the Bardo song of reminding oneself. Why is that so important? Because once we end up in the Bardo, it's too late to remember teachings that we haven't already reminded ourselves of. And by reminding ourselves, gotten used to. And getting used to, is a synonym for the word to practice. To practice means to get used to. What is it we need to get used to? The facts of life, how it is to be alive, how it is to be dreaming, how it is to be in the meditation state, how it is to be passing away, what happens, how it is to have already passed away, where there's no longer any uh, connecting link to a material body and how it is to be so um, uncomfortable with being disembodied that we yearn for a new rebirth. Those six points are what is called the six bardos. But for the, um, for the perceiver, it's the same the whole way through. 
it's just you. It's you being uh, able to perceive and feel in all the different states called the bardo states. There's no uh, changing of uh, the players. There's just one player and that's you. So the bardo is something very personal. It's something very individual and it differs from person to person exactly what happens, how long it takes and uh, whether it is a frightening experience or not, is all personal. The fact that we have something like this today is due to the incredible great kindness of Padmasambhava and Yeshu Sokyal. Yeshu Sokyal wrote uh, this song down as something that belongs to the Dakini practice, the dark blue Dakini uh, Krodi Kali, and which exists in from different uh, Tamas in the past. The really long one is by uh, Nyangral, the great uh, uh, early Tatran master. Then there is a rediscovery by Jamian Kinsim, which is also a thick book. Then there are shorter versions, one by Dunjum Lingpan, and also the one that uh, this song is from, called the, and here comes the Tibetan word, Magyu Sangwe Lamkya, which means Mother Tantra Secret Applications. And it is uh, in a very convenient uh, length, maybe uh, this much. So it, it's possible to chant um, one person in retreat. Some of the other practice you have to have a big group in order to um, be able to have all the details. There's also a short one that is only two pages of uh, dark blue uh, Dakini, which is used for Ch. And there are many, many other versions. Whichever you are familiar with that you have received, that's the one you practice. But the song of reminding oneself can be used by all of you, no matter what practice you have. It only takes a few minutes. And um, I'm asking now the tech personalities to switch it on so that we can follow along. Whether you, uh, if you sing really loud, you can mute your mic. That's um, possible. If you sing beautiful, then you leave it on. All right, let's hear it. Now that while the bardo of this lifetime is unfolding, I will not be lazy since there is no time to waste. And turn on the distractions, path of hearing, thinking, training. While it is just now, I have the precious human form. Since this free and favored form ought to have real meaning, emotion and samsara shall no longer hold the rain. Emma. Now that while the bardo of the dream state is unfolding, I will not sleep like a corpse so careless ignorant. Knowing everything is self-display with recognition, capture dreams, conjure, transform, translucent wakefulness. Instead of lying fast asleep like animals are sleeping, I will use the Dharma just as in the waking state. Ema, now that while the meditation bardo is unfolding, I will set aside every deluded wandering. 
Free of clinging, settled within boundless non-distraction I'll be stable in completion and development As I'm yielding projects to the single-minded training Delusion and unknowing shall no longer hold the reins now that while the bardo of the death state is unfolding I will cast away attachment clinging to all things Enter undistractedly the state of lucid teachings Suspending as a vast expanse is non arising mind Leaving this material for my mortal human body I will see it as illusion and impermanent Emma Now that while the bardo of Dharmata is unfolding I will hold no fear or dread or panic for it all Recognizing everything to be the bardo's nature Now the time has come for mastering the vital point Color sounds and rays shine for self-radiance of knowing May I never fear the peaceful, wrathful self-display Now that while the bardo of becoming is unfolding I will keep the lasting goal one-pointedly in mind Reconnecting firmly with the flow of noble action I will shut the womb doors and remember to turn back Since this is the time for fortitude and pure perception I will shun wrong views and train the Guru's union for if I keep this senseless mind that never thinks of dying And continue striving for the pointless aims of life Won't I be deluded when I leave here empty-handed Since I know the sacred Dharma is just what I need Shouldn't I be living by the Dharma right this moment Giving up activities that are just for this life These are the instructions which the gracious Guru told me If I do not keep the Guru's teachings in my heart how can this be other than myself fooling myself? It's very uh, beautiful and also auspicious that a song by the Dakinis, which was uh, passed on to us with the help of Padmasambhava and Yeshu Sokyal, has now been sung in a new language in uh, English and possibly other, also in other uh, languages. Please, you have my permission. As a matter of fact, you never need to ask for it always allowed to translate the Dharma for the benefit of other beings. And the 
most unselfish way that we are possible, we try to do that. Now for the first verse, which concerns the bardo of this lifetime, that means uh, right now, while you are you in the present body, young or old, doesn't matter. It's your present life. That is what we're talking about. How is it to be you uh, this time around? Very often we just take this life as a given. It's, uh, some people say we only live once and uh, nonsense like that. But let's keep an open mind. Having fixed opinions is the way to be close-minded. And close-minded is a synonym for stupid. I'm sorry to say so, so bluntly, but fixed opinions are stupid. Just keep open mind. And uh, we don't know exactly uh, what's happening and where we are. So let's discover. It's an exploration, just like uh, the world traveler in the old days before the colonists, where, when we just wanted to know what's in the dark areas areas of the world map. And we are now trying to find out what's in the dark areas of this mind, what we call me, I, myself. What are we actually talking about? It's when we ask people and they have to give an answer immediately, they have no words. They, it's it's um, what we actually are, what we call I, me, and myself, is some kind of dark area. It lies um, in vagueness, in other words, in ignorance. That is the basic ignorance for everyone, that we don't know exactly what we are. We can say a name, we can say the shape of the body, that's me, but honestly, what we are is something that was before uh, the body was uh, born, before it was even conceived. We were still there. And when the body uh, dies and we uh, continue, what is it that continues? It's still us. So what is that us, we, me, myself? What are we actually talking about? That's the job of a Dhamma uh, meditator to find out. And we find out this by means of learning, reflection, and meditation, which means hearing uh, words from a competent master, thinking it through, but not only thinking with the dualistic mind, but testing it out so that we get some personal uh, taste for what uh, it is to be uh, a person who is alive in a human body. And finally, we discover in actuality what we are, and that is called the realization. It could be as short as a few seconds, it could be half a minute, and it could be longer. But the identity of that experience is the same as realization. And our job then is to make sure that it does not get interrupted so easily. And that is practice avoiding the realization to be interrupted and broken, but allowed to last longer and longer and longer until at the stage of a Mahabodhisattva, it's unbroken the whole day. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes, we agree on this. That's the purpose of Dharma. Not the, the gathering information. That is the purpose of info dharma, but the real dharma, authentic dharma, is to liberate this mind. All right? Do we agree on this? The purpose of dharma is to free the mind, not to gather information. And if I wanted to, I'd lift my finger like this, but I'm not going to. Not the middle finger. The bardo of this lifetime began at conception. 
it doesn't begin at birth. It begins at conception, when the meeting of the white element and the red element from mom and dad meet together. And then there's a third element, which is not, never mentioned in, the, um, in school, in bio, biology class. And that third element is mind. And there's a fourth one, which is the karmic wind. So, and the fifth one, which is the radiance of Buddha nature. And when all these are combined in the mother's womb and begin to get uh, nourishment, it grows. The element from mom and dad, which are now one, and begins to divide and has uh, a nature of mind and the radiance of Buddha nature and the karmic wind that blows all the time, shaping it and getting it out of whack or a little improved uh, above and beyond the DNA of mom and dad. Sometimes they, they uh, look at the baby and say, where does this one come from? It doesn't look like uh, any of us. This because it's not only from mom and dad. The other um, factors play in. That is how we are uh, at present. And then we get born and we grow up. We start looking like you guys, all different. We're all shaped differently. Even uh, uh, twin, twins who share the same DNA, they still come out looking slightly different in the end. And why is that? We have, yeah, to, we have different um, mindsets, different karmic winds blow in our uh, subtle veins and take the form of thoughts and emotion. And that is often called the ripening of karma, is the karmic wind that blows in your subtle channels all the time. And it has its own breath, 72,600 in, in one 24 hour cycle. And this is how we live. This is how we don't even question that this is me, but actually it's just a karmic wind blowing. We have no choice there. And what we're going to think next, how we're going to feel the next reaction. We are like, um, we get hijacked, just like a, a poor people in an, uh, in an airplane when it gets um, um, taken over by, by other people. They cannot decide where they will fly and where they should go. They have a ticket for somewhere, they end up somewhere else. That is how we are also. When somebody talks to us in a nasty way, we overreact negatively when people, uh, talk to me in a pleasing way, I overreact positively. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, could you just say it one more time? I'm so happy to get praised. And that is called being hijacked, to overtaken by emotion. This we need to be more aware of uh, in our daily hours and then begin to make use of some of the teaching methods so that we can become free rather than it taken, overtaken by another power. What do you think? Should we just be carried along by the nose or should we try to be free? What do we want? Freedom. When do we want it? Now, in this lifetime. When do we get to uh, take really, um, I won't say the word control, but how do we avoid being overtaken by emotions 
and thoughts. That is mainly during the meditation hour. I'll get to that. But during this lifetime, which is short, often we have the feeling we have, that we have lived for so long. But honestly, it's almost nothing. Just a few, um, a few years, and we call that a long life. So Guajin, he said, in this life, which is as short as a sheep's tail, not a horse tail, a sheep's tail, it's just like this, it's a little curly, and that is almost nothing. You cannot use it for anything. Uh, you can use a fox tail or as, to, uh, as a hat, but a sheep tail, I never heard about anything, uh, anyone use it as a hat. It's too short, it's too small. And that is how our life is. The only thing we can really use it for is to make a difference. To make every moment as often as we can count in this life. And we'll... As often as we can remind ourselves to be more aware, mindful, and alert when something happens. Is there anyone here who does not ever drive in a car? Good. Because when you are uh, driving in a car, what is the main job of the driver? To stay on track, on the road, not drive or in the other lane, not drive into the ditch. That's the main job. And then keep the speed, of course. F uh, forward uh, movement is necessary. But not driving into the ditch is what I do maybe a hundred times a day. When an emotion comes, when a thought comes, I get distracted, carried away, diverted from the, from the road, the main track. So presence of mind is necessary in order to stay on track in this lifetime again and again and when we sing a song like this the purpose is to bring us back on track when we remember just the tune a little bit a few words then it's enough so that we uh, become a practitioner once again a practitioner is not some something you become once and then that counts for the rest of your life it would be very sweet and beautiful if, we, if a teacher would promise us that. But unfortunately, I haven't met a teacher like that. Only when taking the Bodhisattva vow, it is said that even while sleeping, you're still accumulating good karma. But that good karma is not the same as the karma for realization. I'll get to that in the meditation bottle. Please sing this. Think about the meaning, bring it to mind uh, every so often. The main thing is um, be aware that this life is on, uh, on loan. It's uh, on lease. You have leased a body from the four or five uh, elements and you will have to pay, give it back in a few years. Just like a hotel room, it's not yours. You are paid, you stay there, you enjoy, and uh, you go to the conference or uh, whatever, uh, to the ballroom. But at the end, you need to pack your bag and move on. The same uh, for us. In a few years, we need to pack our bag and move on. So how do we pack our bag? by daily reminding ourselves of what really matters and then try to stick to it. Next is the bottle of the dream state. I have a little memory of having talked about this once before. 
but now I seem to be sitting here once again. It's a li little bit like uh, samsara. You think you were born once, that, that should be enough. But then what happens? You get born one, one more time and you need to go back to school or, um, or the dog school, human school, whichever. But it's not the end. And the only thing that convinced me of this, because I'm very uh, skeptical minded, was when Tuk Hujin introduced me to non-arising mind. Mind which is uh, like space that does not arise and does not cease. And when he made that clear, then it's much easier to accept that mind is not something that dies. It continues, but what is the it that continues? That is for you to find out. It's not for the teacher to tell. Once you have gotten some clear idea about it, but you're not 100% sure, then is the time for a wisdom teacher to really show this is a, the mind that never arises. And then you say, all right, now I understand. Not with a concept or an idea, but through direct experience. But that's not now. Now is the bardo of dream state, which is usually a um, replay of daytime experiences. Got cut and paste in different uh, order, different shape, but usually the same. People walk with the head up and the feet down in the dream. So there's nothing spectacular about that. If you have a dream where everybody's walking upside down, please send me an, uh, an email. It will be very unusual. But there are other dreams which are completely unlike the daytime experience. That is something you may be able to learn something from, but don't be obsessed with dreams. So Gurdjian said, daytime is a delusion. Dream state is double delusion, double, double lie. Doesn't really exist, but the dream state does not exist at all. Once I, when I find something in the dream, a book or some jewels or like that, and I think, oh, how wonderful. And I want to keep this. I wanted it so much. And I wake up, nothing. It's, it's gone. Why? It was not really there to begin with. This is the meaning of dream. It is experienced, but not really there. Not really there at all. Dreams, rainbows, foam, reflections, all of that are used to illustrate how something is, but not really. It fools us because it looks like something, but then when we try to keep it, we can't because it's not really there. A very simple way um, is go in front of your mirror and try to grab your face in the mirror. It becomes obvious. It's impossible. Why? Reflection is a perfect example for illusion. You can see your face, but you can't take it. Dream state is like that. It's an illusion, but we experience and then we wake up. We need to learn from that. <clears throat> I'll be back in two minutes. So we get that in Pili Mars. <laughs>
Så er det ikke helt fuldt træslet ned. Det er fint. All right, I'm back. The dream state we use on a daily basis as a reminder of the illusory nature of all things. If you are an advanced practitioner who, are a, who is able to practice during the dreams, which is different from lucid dreaming. I don't use the word lucid dreaming because it is not the same as dream yoga. Lucid dreaming means you are aware of dreaming while you're dreaming. But dream yoga is different. It means you are able to practice while you're dreaming. Not just have clear dreams, but enough about that. The third of the bardo states is called the bardo of meditation. And the word for meditation here is the same as Chan in Chinese or Sen in Japanese. It's the fifth of the five of the six parameters, which means stable attention. It means uh, your training in shamatha or calm mind is ongoing, so that you are you are able to uh, remain undistractedly for a longer stretch of time. And even when getting distracted, like your car beginning to drive off the road, you are able to notice that and bring it back on track before driving into the ditch. Once you are in the ditch, then you need to call someone to pull you up. Then it's like becoming aware of your meditation state and you are already in the kitchen making hot chocolate. And then you remember, hey, I was supposed to be sitting and meditating, but hey, uh, it seems like I got a little distracted here. Distraction is the opposite of a, a mind which is a present and aware of what's going on right now. And in our life, we need that. We need to be mindful, uh, undistracted people as often as we can. Why? It's because we have uh, entered the, um, the Dharma army. So now we have to march in, um, in unison, being present and correct and good boys and girls and doing what the Buddhist things. No, it's not just for that. It is because when the mind uh, is allowed a breather, then in that quiet space, new qualities become accessible. That's the purpose of meditation. And what are those qualities? Love and intelligence of a particular kind. A gentle, very clear intelligence. And a love which is not self-centered, but directed not at the others, but in all directions. Omnidirectional love and intelligence, often called wisdom. But when a new person is asked, what do you understand by the word wisdom? For example, compassion and wisdom. It becomes a little um, wishy-washy on uh, able to really put a finger on what is the wisdom. Well, I'll point it uh, out for you. It's you. It's not someone else. It's not somewhere else. It's not some other time. It's your ability to know and to care right now. 
which we train in meditation state to become larger and longer lasting and less rigid. That's the practice of meditation, an open-minded kindness. Open-minded kindness that holds no boundaries and does not refer back to I, me and myself. We need to get used to that way of being. And whether we call it Buddhist meditation or not, really it doesn't matter in the moment. It's you, free and unencumbered. What do we want? Freedom. <laughs> and that is in the meditation state. So when that is the purpose, it does not help to, to put yourself in a meditation prison where we sit with blinders and try to uh, repeat some kind of feeling, some kind of state. And then after 45 minutes, we, we think, now I can stop that and, and be free <laughs> because it's over. When translating for Talking Rinpoche in the past, many years ago, he said to me, why is it that in the West, people look more natural when they finish meditation than when they are meditating? They sit like, and make all kinds of faces, close the eyes and go into some kind of inner space and uh, feel there's something to get there. And they come out of again, back into the real world, into, into real life. What kind of nonsense is that? Complete nonsense. No, um, no surprise that so few Westerners have gotten the title Enlightenment. Enlightened Joe and Enlightened Mary. Why doesn't it happen? It's because we have been brainwashed into misunderstanding meditation. And how does that happen? By the books you read, by the friends you talk with, by the uh, um, whole culture of meditation, which is to take you astray from the uh, path of enlightenment. In the uh, West these days, Anyone can put up a workshop on meditation and, and enlightenment. No rules. It's completely free. Isn't that nice? Yes. No. But anything goes. And there are no guarantees. You can't even trust if somebody is called Lama or Rinpoche or Guruji or um, anything like that. So who has to be the judge? You. This is very uh, interesting. One finger can point at uh, everyone at the same time. But you have to, to judge who is enlightened? Yes or no? Not easy. How do we judge that? Unless we are enlightened too. My main teacher these days, Choginima Rinpoche, he says, kind and wise. That we can understand in somebody else. Can you trust that person? That's um, what, what we have to go with. So once you have gotten you used to the meditation state as well as it gets right now, being calm and gentle, kind, and also intelligent, you're not training in being stupid and unaware. That's really important. I've seen a lot of that. People who go into half comatose, uh, half asleep, and then they call it meditation. Please, dear friends, 
that is not meditation. That is a repeat of a daily habit of falling asleep when you go to bed at night. That kind of state of mind is not meditation uh, training. That's called falling asleep. It's a huge difference. There comes the finger again. A huge difference. <laughs> falling asleep leads to unknowing, uh, gentle presence, which is open-minded kindness, leads to knowing, not unknowing. It's two different paths. So when we practice meditation, we need to know the difference and then practice the right one, not the wrong one. To make a choice, you have to have two and they have to be different. So my job uh, as a teacher is to put out two things and show you the difference. Your job is to choose the right one. All right. So what do we choose? Freedom. When do we choose it? In the meditation bottle. And how often is that? As often as you can remember and remind yourself. Small gaps many times during the day, but longer gaps in the meditation session. And it's better to be a group because you can't really so easily stand up and walk out before the others. So you keep sitting. That's very practical. Those were the first three bhādhas which are trained in while in this body, the bhādhu of this lifetime. Two extra bhādhas, the bhādhu of dreaming and the bhādhu of meditation, belongs under that. But there are more states. There comes a time, I'm sorry to say, when the battery is wearing down, the energizer rabbit start to move slowly. We have, I hope we have gray hairs by this time and a lot of wrinkles and can't walk so easily. But there's no, no guarantee it can happen earlier on also that there is no life left in the body. Or it could be an accident where you are really fit, you have eaten all your dietary supplements um, religiously, and you have done your intermittent fasting and your jogging or whatever, um, and you are still stepping out in front of a car. Or the car driver is crazy or drunk and he just moves you down. And there's nothing you could do. You could take him to the hospital. They try whatever they, whatever they can. They say, this guy is not even sick. So why is he here? He got run down by a car. And I don't know what they say in the hospital for that. But they try their best. And finally, they give up. You lie there on the bed. Your relatives have been called in your lover or your husband, wife, um, your children or mother and father, they're standing there around you. You have a few moments left where you can just say goodbye. And that's it. Then no more breathing. It becomes really hard. And then The end, it just says on the screen. But in the Buddha's teachings, the bhādhu of dying can start a long time before this. It can start with um, that it's harder to stand up than to sit down. You sit down very easily, bang! But when you stand up, it's like lifting weights 
and you can't see so well. You need uh, glasses stronger and stronger uh, every a few months. You can't hear, you need um, hearing aid. You don't remember. Your wife or husband uh, say, can you please stop saying I don't remember? I know you don't remember. But still, you say, I don't remember. It's annoying to not remember. And you can't find the words. Food doesn't taste so great. Like uh, when we're young, food tastes fantastic. But now, it doesn't have the same richness of uh, flavor. And then the energies called the five primary and five uh, subsidiary uh, winds or energies begin to gather into the central channel. It can happen one after the other, like in the Tibetan Book of the Dead or in the Mirror of Mindfulness. It happens, uh, they are described one by one, but uh, that's generally speaking. During an accident, it's all at once and not gradually, but like that especially um, plane crash. You are alive until smack. And then uh, the death process is no longer than that. It's a uh, half a second. But when you're lying in a bed, it could take uh, uh, weeks, it could take months, it could take days, or it could take hours. And f during the dissolution process, when the winds dissolve into the central channel, you lose your five uh, inner organs, you lose the five senses, uh, the five power of the five elements, they become weaker and weaker, until finally there is no longer anything to tie the mind to the body. Then the doctor will come and say, dead. The criteria for dying is a little different in, um, uh, for doctors and for um, experienced lamas. There's something called the circulation of breath, which is uh, measured at the nose. But the inner circulation of breath is not uh, visible or uh, detectable through the nostrils. It is some inner uh, uh, movement of energy. And when that ceases, then the uh, red element from the mother, the white element from the father, positioned at the upper and lower end of the central channel, begin to come together at the heart level. And during this process, there's some very strange uh, phenomena that happens, which is called the whiteness, redness, and blackness. You can study about these. I won't go into them now. But when, when they meet together at the heart uh, center, there's a blackout or a, I won't call it a whiteout, but a very clear, open, uh, cloudless sky and not a blackout. It depends on the meditator. It doesn't depend on whether you have the, red, the, the right explanation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It's individual. If you, through the meditation bottle, have grown accustomed to the very innocent, uh, open-minded uh, presence, which is love without direct or beyond direction, then you will recognize this clear, open, cloudless sky as what? As yourself. That's, that's the real me um, becoming visible now. I'm home. You're welcome to, to make that thought. This is home. This is me. Um, you don't get any metal, but you can stay like that for as long as you have stability in your meditation. And it could last longer. Padma Sambhava says, for as long as it takes a sleeve to be three times, that's enough to be liberated. 
But if you can stay like that for as long as it takes to eat a meal, even better. A friend of mine, um, an American woman, passed away recently and she stayed in the Samadhi after death for a while. I don't know exactly how long, but um, she's not the first Westerner and she's definitely not the first uh, Asian. My crazy neighbor at Nagi Gomba, who talked nonsense a lot of her life, she stayed in Samadhi. She had deep uh, respect and devotion for Kamapa and Tsukuojin. That was her main practice was Kamapa Chino and Omani And that was it. She would pee sometimes right out of her front door. But she also stayed in Samadhi at the moment of death. And people there, they said, if she can do it, I can do it. We can all have good result at the, uh, at the end of death. Not so sure. It depends on devotion and um, real devotion is surrender. Surrendering from the depth of your heart to the state of enlightenment. And whether you think of that state of enlightenment in the form of a person like Kamapa or Tukurjan or the Buddha or Padmasambhava, doesn't matter. Whether you think of uh, the state of enlightenment as being your own mind, doesn't matter. As long as you have deep surrender and trust and devotion, then that will carry you through to a large extent. After the bardo of dying has um, um, played out, then comes uh, what is called the bardo of Dhammata, which is that the radiance of Buddha nature begins to shine unimpededly, without any barrier. There's no physical body to prevent that any longer. As a matter of fact, there is no physical body at all. There's not even a mental body yet. It is formed a little later. Uh, I would say reformed. The mental body um, is much like a dream body, the dream state body. But in the body state, it's more... We'll get to that a little later. The body of Dhammata is no up and down, no here and there, no right and left. Everything is uh, like one uh, huge uh, acid trip or a kind of um, strange, very strange experience where you don't know where anything is coming from. You don't even know where you are, the, that which experiences the whole thing. It's like you can't find uh, uh, up and down here or there on anything. And if that is fine for you, very good. If you've gotten used to that in your meditation state, going a little further, practicing in the, in the dark room, for example, or trickle practice, you'll be very uh, familiar with what is uh, happening now. It won't frighten you. But anyone who likes to have fixed coordinates on everything, that right down is down and up is up, and that's how it should be. And uh, because that's how I'm used to experiencing. Then there's a feeling of discomfort in an extreme way, panic, dread, uh, terror. But that's totally dependent on who you are and how you live your life. It's not uh, a matter of being lucky. There's no luck involved here. It's habit. In other words, it's karma. So when we sing this song, please think of everyone who is not prepared. And imagine that they are uh, sitting, standing around you. And if there's somebody you know who has recently passed away, 
You can sing this song for that person and invite the mind of that person to sing along, to be a part of this. You can do that with all the uh, verses in, in the song. But usually the bardo practice is done for somebody who has passed away. Why is that? Because then we, the lev, uh, the um, the relatives, they think that now is important. All the time is important. As a matter of fact, some will even say that why now why we are alive, alive is more important. Why? Because now we can practice. It's a little difficult to be struck with terror and panic and then be reminded you just relax. It's not easy. It's e more easy right now when I say relax, no panic, right? When the radiance of Buddha nature, which are called the colors, sounds, and um, the rays of light, when they have um, manifested, and uh, uh, officially it's uh, 49 days, officially. But for a great meditator, then it could be like that, already enlightened. For a really um, evil-minded person, it could be like that, already over and going down to a more unfortunate state. We don't know. Only deeply clairvoyant people and not only uh, saying what they feel in the moment, but who can actually see it. Uh, like uh, the 16th Kamapa and others, others who wouldn't admit it, perhaps. It's not easy to see where a sentient being's mind is. In the next Bardo, the Bardo of Becoming, then it be is more easy. Because then there is a mental body, which in the beginning looks exactly like uh, our present body. You can look at your hand, at your feet, and uh, at your body, and you have a body that looks like a human with the head up and the feet down. It's out of habit. The, the karmic uh, body of becoming, is the bardo of, in the bardo state of becoming, in the first half, it looks like a previous life, but then it begins to shift over and begins to look like the next life. And if you are going to be an animal, you'll be horizontal. If you're going to be uh, in the hell realms or hungry ghost, head down. If you're going to be a human, uh, head up. If you're going to be in a very fortunate state, like the Deva realms, then you dream of huge, mansions with uh, beautiful, beautiful gardens and parks. But all experience is personal experience. It dependent on the, your karma and your present realization. So karma is something very real and real and very, very important. It's not something that only some Buddhists believe in. It's not a belief system. It's what happens to you at every single moment is the ripening of karma. Also right now, every sense impression, every thought, every emotion, it's a karma ripening in your experience, like coming and experience and then gone. Never to come back. Karma once ripened never returns. And then the time become, comes when 
you uh, about to take a new rebirth. Um, before that, I have to admit, I'm taking some special medicine these days and I just have to pee. Uh, it's not personal. <clears throat> Here there is a, a word in the text called the Guru's Union Form. Train in the Guru's Union Form. It is um, your personal Guru in union with consort but looking like Padmasambhava in union, either with a, a visible union or with a Kadvanga. But why is that? It's rather than uh, thinking of um, um, when you're about to be reborn someplace that you get attracted to a, a, a horse with consort or a dog with consort. Don't go there. Imagine uh, Padmasambhava with consort as your uh, future uh, father and mother. And uh, rather than seeking a human rebirth, take refuge from your, the core of your heart in the mind of Padmasambhava. And what is that? It's identical with your Buddha nature. Your, the nature of your mind, Padmasambhava's mind, that which take refuge, but that which you take refuge in, are identical. So again, there you can relax for a while, and let uh, 
you can say the process uh, take its toll that you get uh, conceived and then for nine months and ten nine moons and ten days during that time if you're a good meditator you continue your practice there and go through the ten boomers and you are reborn as a, a real tulko in the manakaya buddha and that is how it should be so let's aim for that shall we and If I keep this senseless mind that never thinks of dying, it's not a mind here, it means mentality, uh, attitude. The attitude that never thinks of dying. Do we ever uh, practice that? Is that our main practice? Yeah, sometimes. But now the Bhadu song of reminding is meant for us to make a shift, to change our minds change our mentality so that uh, we are more oriented in the way that Padmasambhava and Yeshu Sokyal and the 100,000 Dakinis are um, singing about. You may, some may have the idea that Dakinis and uh, Padmasambhava are, are totally different. As a matter of fact, Padmasambhava uh, always has the 100,000 Dakinis as part of his system. And the main Dakinis, they also have a, not a trident, but a, a Vajra staff, which symbolizes the, uh, the male uh, partner. So they're never separated for even a moment. The, the real meaning of this is that the wide open quality of buddha nature is never separated from the knowing uh, kind uh, quality they are always indivisible that is the meaning of padmasambhava and yeshu sokyal uh, on the inner level and that is what we are supposed to train in when we do Yeshi Sokyal practice or Padmasambhava practice, we are supposed to uh, acknowledge the real Padmasambhava, the real Yeshi Sokyal, in uh, this mind. Not only acknowledging, but respecting and becoming more and more familiar with, so that at the moment of death, we can continue to be indivisible from Padmasambhava and Yeshu Sokyal. How about that? Is that what we should aim at? Is that a plan? Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Should we stick to the plan? All right. So th this was a, just a very short version of explaining the Bardo song of reminding oneself. It's supposed to have a value, and that value becomes um, tangible, becomes visible when you use the song, when you sing it, and when you mean it while you sing it. So you sing it from the core of your heart, from the marrow of your bones. Padma Zimbabwe says, like a little innocent child calling for mom or dad when lost. With that kind of yearning, not uh, the correct chanting, not like that, but deeply and sincerely and uh, innocently. Then it has a true effect. It is uh, the heart calling from the nature, uh, calling for the nature of mind. And how far are they from each other? This far. No distance. When we acknowledge this uh, no distance, 
from from you to Padmasambhava and Yeshu Sogyal. Then you can sing this song and we will have immediate result every single time. Another key point of the so Bhadu song of reminding is not just sincerity, but also I totally forgot what the main point was. Just give me a, a few seconds. Just to prove that uh, getting old means losing memory. Yeah. The purpose of um, the Bardo Song of Reminding is that you are reminded. That's the main key point. But not only that, one more thing, which is called Munlam in Tibetan. That is a mixture of decision and wish. Your will is at play. Use your will to guide in the right direction with the help of enlightened masters, the teachings, and your personal wisdom teacher. But the main fuel for that is will, willpower. So when you make a, 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 a decision wish, that means you have to really mean it. It's your decision, it's your wish, it's your will. So this is a, a testament for meditators, these six verses. It's your final will. This is what I would like to do. And you're making it uh, in front of Padmasambhava, Yeshu Sokyal, and all the Buddhas, but you're making clear what it is that you want, not what somebody else uh, wants for you, what your relatives want, whether you should be buried or cremated, does not matter. That is something that is important for um, great wisdom masters. What will benefit people and beings the most? It's not what is good for them. They are totally beyond this. Already the, the dualistic mind has dissolved into Dharmakaya. They couldn't care less about what happens with their body. But it is so important for uh, those who are left behind and who, if it's placed inside a stupa, either as a whole body or as a, uh, ashes um, and relics and so, so on, all the beings, humans, birds, uh, who will meet this stupa in the future, walk around it or fly around it, or even just see it from a distance on a photo, will make a huge difference because based on that object, they can make decision wishes. Like that person went through life, so will I. Or make it into a prayer, may I please be like that also. It could also be a dualistic prayer, please help me to also be like that one. It's also fine. Whichever level we practice on, all are good and all will be beneficial in the long run, in the short run, or immediately. So please remember, it's all up to you. How you practice, how often you practice, the quality of your practice. It's not someone else's responsibility. And as a Dharma teacher, my responsibility is just to explain. But it's not my responsibility how you practice. Luckily, I can lean back and relax because it's your responsibility. It's not a joke. It, it's, it's really true. If it was the uh, masters or the teachers responsibility, how people practiced, you would all be looking like Buddhas now, instead of all these different people with hair in different places. And long time ago, 
billions of years ago, we would already be enlightened. Why? Because it was not our responsibility. It was in the hands of the, that Buddha at that time. But it's pretty obvious it isn't. It's, it's, um, it's really free. How we train, what we train in, how often, and the quality of the training, whether we train in the indivisible unity of kindness and intelligence in our, as our meditation state, or whether we train in following the breath and see how it feels here at the right of the center of the nose. If that's how we practice, then that's, how, that's what we get. Many, many people practice meditation in all different ways. And if we were back 50 years ago, we would say, how wonderful people are meditating. But now, 50 years later, we think, great, but what are they training in while meditating? And then after hearing that, then we can say, wonderful, but not before that. And I have to uh, admit, um, I won't call it a blunder or a fault, because I didn't know better. But when, when Tulku Ojin um, had private interviews, and people um, would um, say, so he would ask people first, so what have you been practicing? And one time, Trulsi Rinpoche also asked people like that. So tell me about your practice. And me being an, um, a beginner, a uh, uh, Dharma uh, idiot, I would translate it very literally. What practice have you been doing? Which practices have you been doing? And it, it provoked an uh, answer that took a really long time. I did this practice, that practice, and the other practice, I got this empowerment, and then finally Trulsi Rinpoche said, uh, okay, it seems like you've been doing really well. Next, bring in the next one. That's not how to translate those words. What are you while practicing? How are you while you do that which is called practice? Describe to me how you experience the meditation state. That is how it should be translated. I didn't know better in those, in those years, and now it's too late. Sorry about that, if it's some of you. But now you know how to um, answer uh, the question in the right way, and also to ask it in the right way, which we should be, please, guide me so that I uh, understand and realize the nature of this mind? That's the question to ask. Not just, please guide me. It's not clear enough. It, it means tie your shoes and brush your teeth, go to uh, work with your hair combed to the one side. That would be a how to uh, practice in, the, in daily life. But that's not what you really want to know. What we really want to know is how to make the most out of our the short time we have, and especially the meditation state. How to make sure that it gives a jackpot every time, not just once in a while. Make sure the meditation period gives jackpot each time, not only once in a while. Make sure the, your meditation training gives jackpot every time, not just once in a while. Thank you so much. You can take a few questions if there are any.
Here I cannot talk from personal experience, but what Tulkwajin said is uh, that all your past karma is burned up. Um, it can be burned up within like 10 seconds. Or you can be, and then you can manifest a pure land. Or if you get reborn in somebody else's pure land, then all your past karma gets uh, dissolved and burned out, burned, burned off within 500 years. You practice in the front of, of uh, Amitabha Buddha and uh, there you can uh, visit uh, many other Buddha fields, Padmasambhavas, the Dakini's Buddha field, uh, uh, Udiyana, in the daytime and then in the evening you return back to Sukhavati. But oh, if, you, if you happen to get reborn in a human uh, form, normal human form, then at the, and you haven't broken with your uh, wisdom teacher, it will take you a maximum 16 lifetimes of, of training in meditation. Could be faster than that, but maximum 16 lifetimes. So from a few seconds to 16 lifetimes, that's up to you. And a little luck. Which is just a word. Any other question? There's one question. How to hit jackpot in meditation each time? That is a negotiation um, between what is the way to get jackpot every time that you uh, get by training in authentic meditation, not look-alike meditation, but the real way. When I do like this, then some of the translators, they also do like this, but with two seconds uh, delay. Authentic meditation, what is that? That you should ask your wisdom teacher how to practice shamatha authentically, combined with love and compassion, combining that with vipassana, of uh, inquiring into what is the nature of this mind, and fusing all three together until you are uh, certain, clear, and you have it confirmed by your personal teacher that yes, what you experience right now, that is the right thing. Carry on with that. Or as they say in uh, England, stay calm and keep practicing authentic meditation. Next question. What does it mean that the sound rays and lights and rays are so radiant? So can you, can you what does it mean that Sights, sounds, and colors are the self-radiance of knowing. As a matter of fact, it's already like that, also now, but it mixed with a little unknowing on the way, as the self-radiance of knowing, which means Buddha nature, shines from the heart chakra, some of it gets diverted into energy currents due to the wind of karma, and then you experience that as thoughts and emotions. But it's still the same self-radiance of knowing. But the self-radiance of Buddha nature, while uh, recognizing that it is so, 
and there's a self-radiance of Buddha nature without recognizing that it is so. And that is a huge difference. One is called samsara and the other is called nirvana. It's, uh, it's the same radiance, but played out in two different ways. Big topic. Ask about it again and again. And the good thing about a short song like this is you have key points. You can just say, what does this mean? And you show the teacher the text. Um, there is uh, also some version that has uh, the Tibetan. Some uh, wisdom masters, they only read Tibetan. But also there are some who read the English. So then you don't have to show the Tibetan. Let's see how it works out. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. Okay, time is up, boys and girls. <laughs> time, time to uh, go back to your, your duties, your meditation, and your um, your life. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this. I'm very fond of this song. I'm very fond of the teachings on Bado, which both Tukhojin and Chukinima taught so many times, and many other teachers. And why is this? It's because it's the substance of one of the 17, 18, 19 Tsokchen Tantras, called the Union of Sun and Moon. And there is the main teachings on Bado state. And uh, when it becomes available, Please enjoy, but in the meantime, uh, study the uh, great book of liberation through hearing in the Bado, but also many of the teachings that makes it more uh, relatable. Study life and death and become fearless meditators. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, dear Eric. Uh, may we all be able to follow um, your amazing pith instructions and so many good advice for um, our practice and uh, sing this song with great joy. And we pray for your long life and good health. And um, if people are watching would like to make an offering of appreciation to Eric, please do so through his PayPal account and the link is in the chat. And uh, thank you also to Michael and our tech team and our interpreters, Yang Zhong, Jene, Yuri, Tatiana, Ha and Sashi. And thank you to all of you who have joined the Living is Dying series on the six Bardos. Without you, it would not be screened for all to enjoy, both live, online, and on SI YouTube. And if you'd like to contribute to the costs involved with hosting this and other online programs, you can make your donation through the donation button at the bottom of the page on the Siddhartha's Intent Australia Living is Dying website. The link for this is also in the chat. And very deep gratitude once again, dear Eric. It's such a joy to uh, hear your teaching. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear your sweet voice again. <laughs> and goodbye, uh, all uh, the rest of you. I don't know how many of you. I didn't see more than 25 at a time. Uh, I think yeah. there's around 2,000 altogether, um, Eric. So mm -hmm. all of you, please be kind to the people you meet today. It's really important. And especially, and especially the new Queen of Denmark. Yes. Mm -hmm. And her Tasmanian devil. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much.